All right, people, I'm gonna make this quick, but for the next six weeks or so, starting February 1st, I'm putting all my show outlines up for auction. I've mentioned before that I have a very strict routine for preparing for and recording THC episodes, and part of that process, 95% of the time going back many years, has been waking up early on the days I record and compiling my notes into a roughly four to six page outline that I print out, and conduct the interviews from as a template. I write in the margins, I cross stuff out as we go along, I jot things down I don't want to forget, and I usually have a good deal of material in these outlines that never even makes it to air. When a show is done, I put a little staple up in the corner and throw them in a filing cabinet. Well, it's no secret I'm trying to move, and what better time to try to collect a little extra cash and offload a box of stuff I've been storing that I don't need. So I'm signing, listing, and auctioning off all the outlines I have to any listeners who might be interested in that kind of thing. Each one is totally unique with its own markings, coffee stains, beer spills, printing imperfections, typos, and maybe even doodles in some cases that were never really supposed to be seen by anyone else, but I guess that's no big deal. I know I've personally bought signed scripts before, and some of my most prized possessions are band set lists I nabbed at the end of concerts. So maybe this is something like that for podcasts? If you're into it, they will be listed at ebay.com. Yeah, I know. ebay.com slash USR slash Hireside Chats. The link is at the top of the show notes as well, but it's ebay.com slash USR slash Hireside Chats. And of course, I'll post the links across all the social media dystopias I have an unfortunate presence in. Again, the first batch of outlines will go up February 1st and be listed for 10 days. And I'm going to continue to put up new batches as time permits, when and where I can. And I hope to have the whole thing completed in about six to eight weeks or so. I guess I'm just out when I'm out. But if there's a specific one you might want, keep dipping in to see what's been added. There's a good chance I haven't gotten it listed yet, and a real chance I don't even have it for one reason or another. But I do have most, so just keep an eye out. Thanks in advance to anyone who picks up a little piece of THC history and contributes to the Carlwood Family Moving Fund. Alright, and that said, in more ways than one, let's get this show on the road. Enjoy. Almost surely have a plan This clearly may be something near beyond the realm of man And until you thoroughly tested Every last close trusted view I find the more you think you know The less you really do That's true, Dr. Sayers Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us Just don't know Serenity Now, good people of the internet, doing what we do from sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, and one only has to look at the major events of our lifetimes to see how the puppet masters of the power pyramid work to dominate something and firmly nail down their narrative over any and all other angles, oftentimes even in bold defiance of the actual evidence itself, paying no never mind even to eyewitnesses contradicting the tales they tell because they control the official information streams and can rubber stamp any version of events they deem advantageous. And the loudest voices shout over the soundest ones. And in their infinite patience, the nefarious few's versions of events slowly and methodically become the only versions of events. Like a conspiratorial python calmly wrapping itself around the truth and squeezing the life out of any aspect not in alignment with the pre-approved story until it's gone. And when you marvel at their effectiveness over a single event, or even a single field of study, you wonder how many times they've done it, and for how long has this been the process of creating official reality? Well, we know power and media have been consolidating for decades, and education has been dialing up indoctrination incrementally as well. So it seems as if they've only gotten better at it, and to truly wipe the mental slate clean and observe reality and the human timeline with new eyes is no easy thing. 
But if you're familiar with the work of today's guest, Analog, then you know there are a few tricks to revive what's been lost, and one of them is keyword searching your way through the digitized newspaper article archives by putting in provocative words and phrases. From underground city and buried ruins to giant skeleton and pygmy people. Because you will find stories from the 18 and early 1900s where people were finding things all over America that seem impossible within the paradigm we've been coerced into today. You can follow what he does on his Twitter account, Waking Up With Analog, and you can find him doing plenty of interviews and presentations across other podcasts and YouTube channels. He was the co-host of the Radio Tartary Show until it was banned from YouTube, but I am happy to have him here to break it all down for us today. I hope your seat backs and tray tables are in the upright locked position because we are going on a hell of a ride. The news article archive archaeologist, historical hole filler, and mysterious event exposer. Analog, my man, welcome to THC. Great to be here, Greg. Thanks for the great intro. Yeah, it's an honor and a pleasure, man. I love that you have made this your thing. As soon as I saw the first post, I knew exactly what you were doing because I too have done keyword searches in these old American newspaper archives. And you find incredible things. And to see someone really promoting this and making it their focus and doing a much deeper dive than I ever did is amazing. I know I've mentioned this method of research before on the show, but probably only a time or two here or there over the years. So just to get people oriented with where this information we're going to be talking about comes from, give us a little more context for what it is you do and where you tend to get such amazing material from as well as how you got started on this track. Well, it all started like 10 years ago or so. When I was young, I found a bomb next to my middle school. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, the police came and the bomb squad came and they blew up the bomb and I was interviewed by the news and it was in the newspaper. And several years after the fact, I was telling a story and, you know, my friends didn't believe me. And my mom no longer had the clipping from the original, and I started to have to go looking through an archive, state archive. And through that whole process, I found several other students that had been through similar, and I just thought it was so interesting. <laughs> and I had always been fascinated with the ability, you know, this was, you know, the very early stages of newspapers being digitized. But that event always stuck with me. And then... In 2007, I had a near-death experience. I had a motorcycle accident and had an out-of-body experience at the same time and took me about a year to recover. And during that time, I became very obsessed with trying to understand what I had experienced. And I didn't even tell anybody about it, really, because it just seemed sort of dreamlike. And, and I came across a book called Proof of Heaven. and started my whole journey and I really have been obsessed with reading and alternative views to not only this experience as humans, but history, revisionists, health, all those subjects. And the newspapers have become an amazing medium for me. And I've been doing this for so long, but I've only in the last maybe two or three years started sharing it with the public. Mm. Well, that's kind of a story that rhymes with other stories that life is just so busy and we get in these routines that we just don't even look beyond the surface of anything. And then some event happens where it actually grants you the gift of time in a weird way. And then you do some digging that you wouldn't have had time for otherwise and you find incredible things. I think that's, uh, you know, obviously... It's a unique situation that a lot of people don't have. But when it comes to these newspapers, my take is that people were at the time kind of already all right with mystery and wonder in the 1800s or so. And I don't think newspapers were nearly as tightly controlled, but of course they were eventually bought up, consolidated, and nobody would have known about any of this until these archives popped up. Another good example is the old cartoons of the Rockefellers and Rothschilds having huge tentacles weaving through every sector. There was a time when stuff like that would get printed and then they bought those publications. But what is your take on the suppression of all the stuff we're going to talk about and the process of wiping it all away 
when people were actually talking about it pretty damn openly for quite a while there. Yeah. The consolidation really starts to rear its head around World War I. And you can still, in the context of the types of things that I like to share with the public, hidden archaeology, medicine, yeah, it really gets wiped from the narrative, or at least from the public view, starting in about the 20s. The archaeology stuff, the Smithsonian really got a grasp on it a little bit earlier than that. and. It's few and far between after even the early 1900s to find good archaeological proofs or people talking openly at least about them. Medicine really starts to get cleared up and wiped. Again, right around World War II, a little earlier than that, the 20s. And yeah, um, people were openly talking about, as you just discussed, or just mentioned, the Rockefellers. And yeah, funny you mention that because there is an article that sticks out in my head where they were describing him as a you know, kind of an octopus, essentially, and his tentacles stretching into everything from, you know, they were talking about it from a perspective of not only finance and business, but then they were talking about it from a, the newspaper and information, you know, him gripping that narrative as well, because, yeah, the consolidation of the newspaper starts around that same time, and the Smithsonian had an equal share in that as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Man, so there's a lot of stuff we want to try to fit in, but I had mentioned wanting to hear about the best stuff you found from articles about caves and the underground. And there's no shortage of that stuff. Any person who even just gives a cursory glance to your Twitter feed will see all kinds of things. But what would you consider a couple of your favorites? How would you get us started here? Yeah, so I picked a few based off of that mentioning there. and. Yeah, would you like me to read the articles, or I can just give a synopsis? Whatever you think would be pertinent to the time we have. Mm, I'd say just go ahead and read them as they're written. Of course, you can paraphrase when appropriate, but that way people who are listening get a sense of exactly how these stories are presented in old newspapers. Okay, yeah. So I'm just going to start in with, I picked a cave, and it kind of covers the gamut a little bit, and then, yeah, so I'll just jump right in. This is called the headline is Mastodons in Nebraska. This is from a paper from Georgia, 1894. Now I'm just going to start reading from here. A cave containing prehistoric remains discovered near Cadron. Bones of animals ten times as big as Jumbo, and of birds that would make the American eagle appear like a swallow in comparison, found in a cave a few miles out of Chadron. Evidently the tomb of prehistoric animals who sought therein refuge from the flood. Padron, Nebraska, August 13th. Much excitement has been created by the discovery of a great cave about 10 miles from the city of what is called the Badlands. This cave contains prehistoric remains of petrifactions, the most valuable ever found, which go to establish the fact that giant men and animals lived upon this continent before the all deluging flood engulfed it and swept them out of existence. The discoverer of the cave is Professor W. Don Fritzenholtz, who is traveling through the United States in the interest of a European Institute of Zoology. When seen by your correspondent, was about giving any information relative to his wonderful discovery. It was learned that he consulted some of the legal fraternity of the city in regard to the proper procedure to acquire title. So that's pretty interesting there. You know, he's talking about a fraternity giving him <laughs> the ability to explore the land. So, yeah. But yeah, I am going to just kind of skip ahead a little bit just because it's a long article just to get into some of the what we're after. But sure. So basically, this guy, he goes on to say he refused to say why he wanted to become the owner of this cavern. It was learned from the other sources that it contained many zoological specimens thereof, unknown to the zoological world, as well as a skeleton and a petrifaction of a prehistoric man, which are considered very valuable and they are the first of their kind ever found. Every known specimen of extinct animals are to be found in the cave, and several that were never heard of before. The skeleton of one of these awe-inspiring to look upon, whatever period in the world's history this monster roamed the earth, it is safe to say that mankind did not, and that the most of the animals that now exist were unknown at that time. The skeleton of the monster would indicate that it resembled very closely the elephant, only it must have been ten times as large. 
To give an idea of its size, it is only necessary to give the dimensions of some of the bones. One of the ribs measured 24 feet 9 inches in length, and the others are in proportion to this. Another skeleton resembles that of a horse, and from its size it would seem impossible that it could live if constituted in our present horses are, and it is evident that it would be of no use to the man at present. It would be necessary to use a ladder to harness or get on its back. And if there was a tariff on lumber, it would be utterly out of the question to provide stabling for it. There are also many specimens of birds to be found in the cave, but they are five or six times larger than the ostrich. The bones of the wing, just one wing, would indicate their width, including the feathers, to be 23 feet, so about 50 foot wingspan. There are also a number of extinct species of reptiles and fishes which are so large that it is impossible to conceive how they would be able to move about. The most interesting discovery is that of the skeleton of a man. And as it is said, finding these skeletons with the bones of animals that undoubtedly have become extinct for thousands of years leads many to believe that they must be skeletons of prehistoric man. These skeletons resemble those of the present man very much, and none but an, an expert eye could detect the difference. Hmm. One is that before the country was inundated by the ocean, all these animals congregated in the cave to protect themselves from the water and were drowned. The cave being in close proximity to a natural wall, it is supposed by many that they belong to the race that inhabited this land at the time when these walls were built. So built walls, constructed walls. From the structure of the walls, it is supposed that they were made to enclose large tracts of land and that they were used by the inhabitants at that time as a place of refuge from the enemy in the time of danger. This wall, no doubt, formerly surrounded an ancient city that has become engulfed through volcanic eruption or was inundated by the ocean. Some things go to show that it was engulfed by an ocean as there are to be found in the vicinity of the walls huge turtles, which measure 9 feet and 8 inches across, tending to show that this country must have been deluged at or after the time these ocean, these once beautiful ruins were destroyed. Here was where was found a short time ago embedded among the remains of these extinct animals and reptiles a beautiful and perfect petrified man that was exhibited in the east and which scientific men were unable to say as to what period in the world's history the man existed. There are also to be found huge petrified logs, piled up in great masses, some of them at least 35 feet in circumference, and as solid as a rock. This would indicate that the destruction was wrought by water. It was learned today from Chief Yellow Wolf of the Sayu tribe that these discovery had been made and known to them long ago and that when they would die, they would go to the happy hunting grounds that they believe that this will be the land to which their spirits will return, and the game will be provided for them in abundance and similar to the species found in the wonderful cave, but that they were afraid to tell the whites as they feared that they would destroy the cave and then their ancestors would never have the pleasure of examining the skeletons of the kinds of game provided for them by the Great Father when he called them to his happy hunting ground. Hmm. <laughs> Damn, man. There's so much there that is really interesting. And obviously the overarching theme seems to be that this story supports the kind of biblical flood thing, the Nephilim, like this kind of story. It seems to be more and more valid as we unpack more and more things. The, the more guests I talk to, the more I find people kind of gravitating to that sort of paradigm in the past, fallen angels and all that. And just to not pick it apart too much and move on to like other ones, even the first one you had sent me is pretty wild. Just to read the parts you highlighted, Astounding Discoveries, 1869, prehistoric remains dating back to the founding of the Assyrian Empire 44 centuries before Christ. While carrying out the gigantic undertaking of bridging the Mississippi, remains dating back to the founding of the Assyrian Empire were found. 
At this point, the wonders begin. Builders also found a tunnel under the Mississippi, all the way to the Illinois shore, opening into an unknown subterranean passage, systematically arched, cutting through solid rock with substantial masonry, the bottom worn by carriage wheels of some sort, subscriptions in uniform runic characters between the niches, draped obsidian or Egyptian heads. Passages on the north side extend to the Great Mound, now being removed by the Missouri Railroad. Monk's Mound, an enormous chain of mounds from river to bluff spanning nine miles. The tunnel under the river and mounds are connected. The opening in the mounds connects to a subterranean highway. Explorers came to a flight of 41 steps and then another chamber of wonders. The walls sculptured in bas reliefs and runic inscriptions. Like, <laughs> this is amazing, man. I've found articles about finding giant skeletons, but this isn't just some bones. This sounds like something that would be under the Giza Plateau, but it's under the Mississippi River. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. And thank you for reading that. Yeah. So, yeah, there's so much to pick. We could just spend this entire episode talking about that article. Yeah. But what I've been postulating in the past, and I've said on some other shows, is that the mounds, some were burial mounds, some were not. Most of them pyramidal, the big ones, and that they were all connected to an underground subterranean highway. So as that article said, the highway connected the mounds, and Monk Mound is an incredible mound. So star forts, pyramids, mounds, all, in my opinion, are access to some subterranean world. You know, you've had enough guests on here that talked about this, and I have tons of articles that corroborate the same thing. And the Mississippi area, and you, obviously, St. Louis, I sent you another article. I think it was the first one I may have ever shared with you. And it was talking about a mining company. They were digging coal shafts so they could decide where they were going to start advancing their mining equipment. And at 300 feet, they broke into air. They broke into a chamber. And they sent men down. And the men described a completely formed city with buildings four or five stories tall, paved streets, fountains that were still running, water still flowing in the fountains. And, you know, as outrageous as that may sound to some people, that article you just shared, and again, I have posted, you know, thousands now, and I have many that I haven't shared, and they're just absolutely, it blows your mind, really. And yeah, that one goes on to basically describe a scene where Queen Elizabeth is being crowned by the king, or the leader of the area. And yeah, the Assyrian, Egyptian, cuneiform, tablets, texts, all of these things are found all over America, and kind of reconstructing what I've hypothesized that America is the true, quote, old world. And these stories of the Canaanites and the Egyptians and all of these things really happened here. And again, that sounds like a stretch to some, I'm sure, but you read enough of these articles and you're going to really uh, start to build a completely different perspective of history. Yeah, absolutely. And like you just said, you've got all kinds of articles with all sorts of stories of underground communities or cities, I guess, far more elaborate than some bronze tools and skeletons in a cave. And yes, it does get even crazier with these underground lakes and rivers. I've heard you say there are even petrified boats as if these waterways were navigated by ship at some point in the past, all underground across America. And you've started to conclude that maybe the Gulf Stream coming from underground Colorado into the Gulf of Mexico was the original Fertile Crescent. Correct. Well, elaborate on some of that if you could. Yeah. So originally, not originally, but over the years, I've really, um, through not only these articles, but my own explorations, developed the opinion again, going back to what I was saying about this being the old world, that I really had to kind of invert my own view of not only biblical history, but natural history and geological history. And when you study the Yucatan and Florida from a geological perspective, they're incredibly interesting. 
There's no bedrock. Some of the purest water in the entire world is found on the Yucatan and in Florida. You know, again, through a lot of my posts, I've shown that once radium became a um, kind of hot topic in the early 1900s, late 1800s, they began testing spring water, not just from Florida and Mexico, but all over Switzerland, Austria, Germany. And they found a lot of these, quote, healing springs were filled with radium. And through these tests and things, they found that not only is the springs filled with radium, but the oceans are filled with radium. And along the equator is the highest concentrations that they found. And the largest amount of radium in ocean water was found, this is a study from the 1970s, was found in the Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, you go to the story of Ponce de Leon and you know, people trying to find the Fountain of Youth. Well, I believe they weren't trying to find it. They knew it was there. You know, the geological record of Florida is incredibly interesting. There are giants found all over Florida. Redheaded giants. There were Indians. There were some of the first people that the Spanish ran into who were far above your average European height. High six is low eight feet tall. And in their account, they were living for hundreds of years, 200, 300 years. And the Gulf Stream, one of my articles that we're going to actually get into here in just a little bit, they hypothesized the creation of it. And when you study the Gulf Stream, it's quite remarkable. And when I was studying the Baltic a long time ago, I made similar correlations to the construction of Florida and Yucatan to an island in the Baltic called Gotland. And Gotland is an incredible place filled with a lot of ruins, a lot of ancient churches, an incredible subterranean world. And the island was completely closed off to outsiders, I think until the late 1980s. But they've been finding the most large and ancient collections of coins and Arabic coins to be more precise. And that's really interesting when you study Arabic coins and why they're being found all over the world, predominantly silver, not gold. It kind of starts to connect with the dots I've been making about the ancient sea peoples and, you know, who these people really were, you know, connecting it with the Moorish Empire and Florida and the Gulf play a huge role in that. And, and New Orleans, it's called the Crescent City, and there's no more obviously terraformed place than the entrance into New Orleans. The entire peninsula is completely man-made. All the canals, and they're very ancient. You know, the earliest maps, you can see the canals. And the whole Gulf of Mexico is covered in ancient canals. Florida as well. When they tell you they're building canals, if you dig deep enough, you'll find they're just dredging out ancient canals. And the stuff they're finding is incredible. These canals are covered with giant walls and Tampa, Galveston, New Orleans, just about every city on the Gulf has incredible ancient construction that they can't really describe, and they don't attribute it to the Indians that they're finding there at the time. Man, well, you mentioned radium, and so let's dig into that a little bit, because I think we've both looked at enough stuff to realize that our scientific and energy paradigm is completely wrong today. They've dismissed the ether, they've suppressed electromagnetism, and it seems to me that a lot of this natural tech can actually be used with far less equipment, let's say. You could take crystals and build towers and extract energy from the environment in ways that seem impossible today, but that's because our paradigm is completely off and that is how you can have these instances of advanced technology, quote unquote, far before any industrial age. In fact, it seems like the world's fairs and the industrial age were a way of killing off a lot of that old stuff and dominating a new paradigm by the robber baron class. So we are kind of in our infancy of actually understanding electromagnetism, ether, crystals, and plasma. But it seems like there was a time when this information was widespread and even terraforming in the way you talked about was not so difficult for them. But 
you do find pieces of this in your work as well, right? Along with similar insights related to radium. What are your thoughts on some of this technology and the processes and the materials used, including radium? Yeah. Tech and machinery and the industrial age, as you kind of glossed over there, were definitely part of the transition away from this age. Radium is an incredible thing. You know, you don't hear anything about radium really anymore. You know, it's uranium and, you know, people think of the atomic bomb and weapons. And although weapons were being experimented with a lot in the early 1910 through 19, you know, up until World War I. And, you know, since I mentioned World War I, a really interesting thing to mention about radium is that almost all of the mining of radium was controlled by a company or a group of people called the German Syndicate. This is what the papers, multiple papers were calling them, the German Syndicate. And I traced that to a trust, a German trust. And I'm basing the name off the top of my head. But what makes this interesting is that, you know, on your show, you've talked a lot about, you know, the Vril and, you know, some of what the Nazis were experimenting with. Well, I think it's very, very much directly related to radium. Anti-gravitics. Radium was described as being, you know, the philosopher's stone. Helium was first discovered by experiments with radium. And the reason it was given that name was because a byproduct of radium is helium. Hmm. So not only does radium have an incredible half-life, it loses no weight over time. And it creates such a monumental amount of energy. And helium is a byproduct of that. So when you start to talk about anti-gravitics and obviously blimps and aeronautics, you know, that's part of what people talk a lot about when discovering these different ages. Well, I've hypothesized, and we'll get into a little article here in a second, that not only were they using radium as a mode of propulsion and power, but they were also using the helium which was a byproduct of creating this power to keep these aloft. And, you know, who had the most incredible fleet of blimps at the time? Well, it was Germany. And I think Germany's ability to, in a sense, take on the world and have the fighting force that they did, I think was, I think there's a lot of technology that was going on in World War I and World War II that has been kept from us by the government. And mm -hmm. Germany would be the one, I would say, harnessing a lot of that. Yeah, that makes sense. And you actually posted an article from 1897 from a California paper that was titled, The Secrets of Aerial Flight Revealed the Law of Gravity Can Be Overcome with Radium. And it shows a sketch of a person in an airship. And this is one of those things that keeps popping up. It seems like the Hindenburg was a staged event of mass trauma to scare people away from this tech, and it's never come back. But I wanted to let you get into the, the article you had ready, if it was different from that one. No, it's that one. And yeah, it's so funny that you saw that, because I was just getting ready for this talk. So I wanted to have everything organized. And yeah, that's one of my favorites. Again, tying this into this German syndicate, you'll connect the German syndicate with NIMSA. Yeah. You know, you've had Bosley on. He's talked a lot about this. Great work there. But yeah, the Trump connection is very interesting with NIMSA and the blimp, as you're aware, because it also connects with one of the largest purchasers of radium in America at this time was a watch company that goes by the name of Ingersoll. You're familiar with that name? Sounds familiar, but not exactly. So there's a writer who writes about Baron Trump, the time traveler, right? Yeah, that is her name. So the watch company Ingersoll, because radium wasn't made available to the public, really. You had to work really hard to get in. It was incredibly expensive. And one of the largest purchasers was a watch company, which I thought was incredibly strange. And then when I made the connection between the families, it was even more interesting. So you got the Trump blimp on the NIMSA blimps, you know, the tests that were going on in Southern California. A lot of the technology people have hypothesized with that is that they were using some kind of magnetism, some kind of advanced technology, but it's incredibly vague. 
and then you make the connection with the Ingersoll Watch Company. And the reason, I think, you know, the public reason that they were buying so much radium was that they were using it because radium can make metals glow. What they told the public is they were using it to make the watch hands glow on their watches. Hmm. But I've hypothesized there was much more to that. And yeah, you talked about crystals and old technology. Well, radium does amazing things. And when you put crystals near radium, the crystals absorb the energy and they store it for long periods of time. And when they different crystals turn different colors. So they were doing all these tests with crystals and they were finding, okay, well, diamonds turn orange and this crystal turned. This. So every crystal had a different reaction with the radium. And, you know, making connections with, you know, the stories of Atlantis and these ancient people were using crystals for, you know, radio communication and all these different things, power, devices, weapons, so on and so forth, lasers. They were creating lasers with crystals and radium. And yeah, the radium is, it just bridges the gap with so many technologies that we've talked about, you know, old technologies. and. The reason why I think a lot of this has kind of gone underground was what we were mentioning before with the technology and war. And I think part of the whole driving force between maybe World War One and maybe World War II was tech and the Nazis. And they were using this and they were controlling all of the radium mining in the world. So weird connection. Yeah, very interesting. And for people who aren't aware, don't remember that old show, what you're referencing is the Baron Trump books written in the early 1900s by Ingersoll Lockwood. That's the name of the author. Maybe it's a pen name. Who knows? Maybe it alludes to two different family names. But this woman wrote three books about little Baron Trump. One was called The Last President, one's called Travels and Adventures of Little Baron Trump, and one's Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey. So she folds into this story from a century ago, like president and the hollow earth kind of thing. And I, I always thought those were interesting. I actually bought the first one because I needed to believe it wasn't some internet LARP. I needed to hold it in my hand and know it was a real book because it was just too eerie that it, it had such a synchronicity. Uh, but yeah, I think you're totally onto something interesting. I also heard you talk about radium and thorium in healing springs, that part of these stories of healing springs relates to radium. It's apparently one of the most life-giving things. You say it's where Ra got his name because it glows like the sun. Like that's probably what they were talking about is some technology that they used with radium. And that when you look at Florida and probably other places as well, most of the major cities are built on where they would say there were healing springs and the springs had this healing quality because of the radium in it. Is that pretty accurate? Absolutely. Yeah. You can trace this to the Yucatan too. All of the major temple sites in the Yucatan are built on these springs. So not only do you need water, obviously, for you know a city or whatever you want to call it, group of people, you know, as part of life. But you'll find that you can't make it a coincidence that, again, the Yucatan and the peninsula of Florida have the most springs in the world. Florida, number one, the Yucatan, number two. And not only that, but they had healing spring hotels in Florida. And then to go backwards a little bit, guess who was buying up all of the land or the springs themselves? in the early 1900s. Well, that's Rockefeller. Hmm. And on one of your previous shows, I can't remember the guest name, but he talked about the Healing Springs of Arizona and that a lot of these robber barons were taking vacations. That was a big thing to do with a lot of these high-class people was they'd visit these springs. And Arizona was one of them. Rockefeller visited a, a Healing Spring there, and he ended up buying it as well. Hmm. So no coincidence there. <laughs> no, no. I believe that was Corey Daniels, too, just covered the whole area of, of that desert, the American Southwest. Yeah, in Arizona. So part of what I've done is I've actually gone into every state archive and 
created essentially what I will eventually be presenting mysteries and lost civilizations based state by state. And Arizona is by far one of the densest ones. The things they were finding there. And I know you're familiar with the Kincaid article about the Egyptian temples and so forth. Well, I got a Kincaid article that's like times a thousand. I love it. That a group of miners actually found a city down in, not a cave system, but basically down in the ground. And there were people there. It was a living city full of Egyptian people dressed as you would imagine, you know, the kind of stereotypical Egyptian dress. Stonehewn temples, you know, the sun with the wings, all of that stuff. Wow. Yeah, incredible stuff. And Arizona is just part of that. But getting back to what you were saying, yeah. The radium connection, the Gulf terraforming. Again, these things might all be a stretch, but once you start connecting the dots, it definitely seems like the Fertile Crescent City, Eden as such, was here in the Gulf. And we mentioned a little bit, we were talking about the Lodestone. And another name for the Lodestone as a worship stone is the Kaaba Stone. Mm. And the Kaaba Stone is. Cuba, Cuba, the Kaaba. And the Phoenicians were not necessarily a group of people, but more of like a brotherhood. And like masonry, they had different levels. And the highest a Phoenician could reach in this society, it was called the Eye of the Needle, or the Q was the label of it. And only at that time would you be taught magnetism and you know sailing was a big part of this obviously because sailing was freedom and knowing how to traverse the oceans and all of these things well this ties in with the merchant race the merchant class you know people can describe it as you know the moorish but there are many things of it finnish phoenician the etruscans the etruscans are one of the earliest civilizations found in mexico but yeah I'll get off topic there, but you can find so much here in the Gulf that it would blow your mind. You know, Mm -hmm. Mexico and and the Aztecs and the Mayans, well, it goes way deeper because below a bunch of these ruins that we know as today, you know, these Mexican ruins, well, they excavated a hundred feet down on some of these ruins and they were finding several different layers of civilization. One that was wiped by fire, one that was wiped by flood, another that was wiped by mud. And the Mayan cosmology describes, you know, four different ages that were all destroyed by four different elements. <laughs> Man, I want to ask you more about the lodestone because I know you know a lot about it and it's one of your favorite topics, but I just wanted to throw this in as well. So this is a quick one about a huge room found underground, Mammoth Cave in Alabama, article from 1888. The discovery of what promises to be a wonder, a second Kentucky mammoth cave found. They estimate the main room to be 250 to 300 acres in area, having no supports, but a solid arch, one half mile in length. The side walls and overhead are covered with the most beautiful crystals, which glistened in the lantern light. And in many places, tall pyramids of stalactites and stalagmites were found unequal to any ever seen before. After going three or four hours, traces of water were found, and after going in a quarter mile, they found a magnificent lake of pure, fresh running water, crystal clear, and full of silver fish without eyes. (laughs) So it's like, again, uh, underground, maybe it is radium that makes such crystal clear water. Obviously, it's unadulterated from pollution, from the surface in general, but that's just a quick, easy one, just to give another example of the many, many articles you have about huge underground things. I mean, 250 acres, that ain't small. No. But Yeah, a great one. Lo- lodestones. So you mentioned that the obelisk that is in uh, Central Washington, Park. D- Central Park, okay, in Central Park, uh, was decoded or was translated, and they talk about taking the load, like using it almost as like a flying carpet, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Yep. But the lodestone is also considered to be supposedly 
the capstone of pyramids or the great pyramids. And you said it relates to egregores. You got to tell us about this because this is very unique. What is Lodestone 101? <laughs> lodestone 101. So the lodestone is the magnetic stone related to magnets that, you know, your everyday magnet. But to kick it up another notch, it's kind of the basis of all religions. In old alchemical writings, they described the lodestone as a living deity and that they were worshipped. And the egregore and the thought form stuff is a rabbit hole that would take very long to describe, but basically they were making statues or they were just worshipping the stone itself. And the stone, when they would start to lose their magnetism or their power, however you want to describe it, they said the best way to recharge it was with blood. Goat's blood, specifically. In one of my articles, they described that the goat and the blood of the goat was the best way to re-magnetize or re-energize the stone. So this could be part of the sacrificial system that people are familiar with. The altar. Many altars were built atop stone. And it goes even farther than that. You know, the sacred coronation chair that's in England now that was taken from Scotland. The story goes, and this is a lodestone, the chair is built around the lodestone. The story goes that the stone would choose the next king and that people would come and sit on the chair and it would hiss. It would make this humming sound. Hmm. And they would know that that person wasn't meant to be a king. And it wasn't until someone sat down and the stone was silent that person would be made king. Now you find stories like this, the sword and the stone, King Arthur. That's an allegory, in my opinion, that only the person that the stone chooses can remove the sword. And the stone, as I've talked about before and shown through my research, in my opinion, of course, but was known as the deity Janus. And Janus was the Roman deity, the two-faced god. And it's my opinion that he was the god of gods, that every, all these different religions and these different groups of people all have these different pantheons, essentially, and they all go to Janus. And what that is, is it's the lodestone, it's magnetism. You know, the two hemispheres of the brain, just the dualistic nature of our realm in general. And that's kind of like the starting point. Janus and the lodestone, the symbol of which were the monad. And, you know, the flower of life and all these different geometrical shapes, you know, through the monad. This is what I was talking about a little bit, too, when we were mentioning Cuba and the Gulf of Mexico, and the Fertile Crescent. Well, symbolically, the Fertile Crescent would be the egg, or the womb. And the Cuba, or the Kaaba, the impregnator, would be the sperm or the cell. And the monad, and the center inside of a cell, right, the dot inside of the circle, would be the impregnated egg. And when you study how cells divide and replicate, they follow the flower of life, this pattern that I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is all magnetic. And the sperm in the egg is this sim symbology. You know, it's in the Washington Monument. It's everywhere. The phallus worship is the sperm in the egg. And it all goes back to this one symbol and this one deity. And yeah. Many churches have a sacred stone. You know, I mentioned the Kaaba stone. The Torah has sacred stones. Christianity has sacred stones. Much of what we describe when we hear about Jesus being the door and the path and all of these things. Well, Janus is the door. He was the key carrier to gateways, pathways, river systems, arches. And he has a million overlays with Jesus. Hmm. And many other quote-unquote gods. But yeah, that's just kind of a quick synopsis. Right on. I could go all day about Janus, <laughs> but again, people that are interested, it's a rabbit hole. I'm sure, I'm sure. But it is something I don't hear a ton of people talking about. So kudos to you for having kind of a your thumb on the pulse of something that just is pretty off the radar for a lot of other people. And so... While we still have enough time for one more thing in the first hour, it's got to be orphan trains and baby farms. This is a real synchronicity for me and a total 180 from everything we've been talking about, kind of. But 
One of the threads that's just insane that I've been really interested in over the last year or so is these orphan trains, that if you do some digging, even just a basic Google image search at the beginning of the industrial age, little kids were being loaded on trains and shipped all over the country and all over the world, really. They'd arrive in the city and it would just be announced, hey, the train is here. If you need some laborers, come and get them. And It starts to seem like towns and cities were being repopulated after some massive cataclysm or some type of reset. Okay, but then you have this other layer where the world's fairs were showing off incubator babies with no parents to be found around them. And this other channel that's quite popular, Mind Unveiled, who I'm talking to right now actually about coming on and arranging an interview. Well, they did this wild video showing all these old postcards and artwork of growing babies like baby farms with imagery of them being grown like crops. And these old postcards and images are just really interesting, but it also kind of invokes the brand Cabbage Patch Kids, this allusion to a real history of growing, cloning, farming children at a time when no one would consider that possible. And then the synchronicity is that you actually talked about this even before Mind Unveiled went viralish with it. So now I have to have you break this all down and talk to us about how you even ended up coming across it and how you fit this into the larger context. What is the deal with these baby farms or this early cloning program? Yeah, so years ago I was I bought a book about the exhibition that happened here in my home city, Portland, Oregon. And because, you know, the research for it, this was years ago and it was few and far between. And, you know, it was a bit of an echo chamber as far as what people were saying about it. Kind of like what you mentioned with the Ingersoll book. I wanted to get my hands on something and really kind of dig into it myself. Mm -hmm. And the number one thing, aside from the construction, was the incubator room. So just through that, it just was incredibly interesting to me. And I wanted to understand a little bit more about it. And yeah, it led me down a rabbit hole. The Cabbage Patch imagery. Well, again, people can look through some of my old posts or you can do some of your own research. Mine unveiled, you know, he does great work. We've had a lot of dialogue over the years. This is an image that was shown in the newspapers. Babies being grown. Again, this kind of ties in with historic imagery. You know, babies being delivered. And Mm -hmm. guess what? Babies were delivered to your door by the post office. (laughs) I heard you say that. Uh, Pretty unbelievable. But apparently there's some some written material you found that suggests that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Again, people can look into this themselves or look into my work or mine unveiled. You know, he did obviously a much more in-depth video on it. But yeah, I did an interview with Andreas Exertis, I think three years ago now. And through that book I got about my exhibition, I started looking into the incubators. And that's a fairly difficult subject to find information on. You really got to dig. And the patent work on it was incredibly interesting. You're finding a lot of odd companies. Rockefeller had his ties in it as well. And Europe had what were called baby farms. They had baby farms in America too. But Europe had the big, big ones. Royalty of Russia, St. Petersburg, royalty in Switzerland, Austria, Poland. They had what they called baby farms. And the biggest one I could find was, I believe, St. Petersburg. This is public information, which is incredibly weird. They touted that they had 15,000 babies in their baby farm. Now, what they are doing with these kids... One can only guess, but when you study orphan trains and all of these things, it seems very much like these were some sort of a tool for repopulating areas. And when you look at the movement West in America, not just the movement West, but that's a big one, I would say, percentage-wise, the orphan trains have a huge part of that. You'll find factories all over the East as well that after the Civil War, were being filled with children. And where are these children coming from? Well, it seems the majority of them are coming from Europe. And where they're coming from before that, where are their parents? 
I think this has a lot to do with more lives being lost in World War I than we know. And the Bolsheviks tie into this. And you could even take it a step further since we're talking so much about the underground. I've hypothesized, too, that there were part of these underground cities. And they connect with dumbs. Deep underground military bases are all where these cave systems were. In my old articles, they pretty much correlate almost perfectly. So the governments are taking over these old world cave systems. And I would postulate that there are cities down there, very, very large ones. I have a handful of articles about incredible cities that they found completely intact. Like I said, some with running water, some with cities, some with lights still burning. They called them an everlasting flame. They were using natural gas to light their torches. Then they, they were still burning when they got down there. This was found in Mexico, in Missouri, Colorado, Nevada. They find ancient cities. The lights are still on. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Anyways, I've hypothesized that part of that was they perhaps were raising these children underground. Could it be clones? I don't have any textual evidence of that. I say at this point in my life, anything's possible. And then, you know, you have some of that Epstein stuff that ties nicely into, you know, what he wanted to do and what he was doing and, you know, his compound where he had tons of underground facilities and, you know, he wanted to raise a population based around, you know, his blood or, you know, his children essentially. And, you know, mm -hmm. Star Wars references this with taking the one man and creating an entire army of clones from him. But yeah, it's very interesting and not outside of the realm of possibilities when you're looking into the things that I talk about. <laughs> yes. And it's unfortunate that we don't have the visual reference because when you start looking at these postcards, you're like, who would make these and what are they about? It, it, it's, it's very strange. And it's creepy. Yes. I've also looked into some kind of ethereal science related to the connection between electricity and biology. And there's some interesting stuff there. It's not just about using the ether to light lights or, or create electricity or energy in that sense, but there's a real relationship with biology and they've done experiments with exposing salmon eggs, I believe it was, to different frequencies and they grow three times bigger. Yeah. And weird stuff like that Frog happens. Frog eggs. Yeah. They did, it with, yeah. they did it with rats. They did it with things that weren't just eggs, but yeah, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So you probably even know more about that rabbit hole than me, but it seems like it rhymes a little bit with this babies and incubators thing. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a technology there that again, it isn't some, uh, it isn't super complicated where it needs some big genetics lab, but it's something more with these natural forces that maybe you blast an, uh, some kind of mammal egg with a certain frequency and it turns into a human baby. I don't know how that stuff works. It's very hologram ish, but, uh, there's some weird stuff there that could make this seem even more possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they were doing experiments with radium and frog eggs. And I believe what they don't want to put out in papers and when the government started doing its own experiments and the Germans were 30 years ahead of the U.S. government. Again, while I was postulating that perhaps these world wars had something to do with this. But in one of my articles, I've and I have it shared on Twitter, they talk about creating a race of superhumans with radium. Mm -hmm. Men that will have superior strength and can't die. And I've also kind of done some movie decodes over the years and talked about how, you know, the Hulk and these Marvel superheroes, that these all are related to radium experiments and things that they were, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. I believe that they're getting a lot of these stories from actual things that were happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's some entry level stuff regarding that where you could look at all the James Bond films and Ian Fleming and he was connected to intelligence and then all these Bond supervillains are actually yep. carrying out plots that seem to be real conspiracies. So that's like layer one to that. And yeah. I'm sure it just goes even deeper. But if you can find layer one, at least that's a precedent for seeding things in fiction. And I, I definitely think they do so that. When someone hears about Egyptian stargates, they're like, oh, you mean like the movie Stargate, you moron? 
And it's like, well, where do you think the movie Stargate got the idea? Oh, exactly. It's like they kind of flip it on you because the psychology is, oh, you're pulling things from movies and trying to say they're real. It's like, well, you know, look at who wrote the script and and who they're connected to and what secret information they might be privy to. But you are really great at finding unusual things and then putting them into uh, a new context. And I appreciate it. As we're wrapping up, I wanted to ask you more about this concept of Tartaria. A lot of these things we've talked about fall under the broad umbrella of Tartaria research, let's just call it. And in all of these isolated examples and articles are some really fascinating things that don't make sense with the current model of history or science. But when you add them all up and label this ancient, advanced, widespread culture Tartaria, there are just so many researchers in the broad conspiracy field that are pretty open to a lot of things, but on Tartaria, they just say this is a bullshit conclusion from people who are ignorant of history and are cherry picking these things and making wild leaps to construct this utopian model that is just not accurate. I know several of them that have done real mind blowing work and then say, well, the Tataria stuff is dumb nonsense. They say Tataria was never a civilization, but it was a sort of pejorative term for huge swaths of the unexplored world back in the day. I just feel kind of stuck in the middle of finding this all really fascinating, but also not really knowing how far to really run with it. And you didn't bring up Tartaria at all. These are just newspaper articles of very interesting things. But you are aware, obviously, with the name of your old radio show, that this is a segment of conspiracy research that is typically labeled Tartaria. Well, I guess I'm asking you to speak to those researchers or to speak to this division of what those folks might be missing that keeps them from entertaining this Tataria idea or just your thoughts on that label. Yeah. Um, you know, my posts can seem incredibly outlandish or fairy tale esque in a lot of ways. And I don't blame people. But as you've learned in life and as I'm learning as well, you need so much information and you need to really invest a lot of time into getting a million different opinions and looking at a million different perspectives to build your own opinion of things. And nothing could be more true than talking about Tolkien's writings being, in my opinion, true, or a more realistic description of what the world was like, perhaps a reset ago, an, an age before some kind of cataclysm. And Tartaria fits in that umbrella as well. If you haven't invested enough time, you haven't looked at all the people being described as Tartarians, you haven't looked into the languages, if you haven't invested enough, it's going to seem really crazy. And there's a positive into that and a negative. There are a lot of people that talk about this golden age being Tartary. I don't think that was the case at all. There was war. <laughs> there were people doing horrible things. Tartarians doing horrible things to other, quote, Tartarians. How I like to describe it is most of this literature is written under control or at least through the lens filtered of Rome or the Catholic Church. And they described, like you said, unexplored areas. I think it was areas that they didn't have control over. They would just label, because, you know, Barbar and Tartar come from the same root, and often they were insulting terms, kind of ways of describing people less capable, less advanced, less educated than them. And it also related to paganism, people that didn't prescribe to this Catholicism. And there's enough history out there in a million books about all the forced conversion that the Catholics were doing all over Europe, and it spread out from Rome. We talked a little bit about the Ben Ben Stone and Janus, where it all starts there. All roads lead to Rome. We could talk about just the stone and the worship of the stone and the pine cone. The pine cone and the, quote, Symbology of the pine cone comes from the stone pine type of tree hmm. and the pine nut and the pine cone. Now, this tree is all over the world. You can find it all over the place. It's even grown in Hollywood. But as a symbol, this is the pineal gland. 
which people have talked about, but the pineal gland was the realm of Janus, the gateway, the doorway. And yeah, so you could think of a kind of new paradigm starting in Rome, and I've connected it with a new magnetic stone becoming God and creating its reality. Again, that's out there, but you know, I'm not afraid to get too weird on your show, so I will. <laughs> yes. Basically, it branched from there. And to use the octopus reference that you know you so use in your symbology of your show, the tentacles or the roads of Rome extend from there. And the places that they didn't have control over were often labeled or Tartaria or Barbaria, west and east of Rome. Yes. Tartaria, you know, to the east and Barbaria to the west. And often there were big confederacies in Tartaria. And I would say it was mostly based on a merchant class. That when you look into the West India Company and these first founding corporations, you can kind of see the tentacles taking over this huge empire. Some call it the Moorish Empire. There's a lot more to it than just the Moorish Empire, but that's a big part of it. The expulsion of the Moors and the Jews from Spain in 1492, that's a big part of it. Columbia, or Columbus wasn't coming over to an, a land they knew nothing about. They were chasing the people they expelled and trying to take over this same concept. And you can trace the wars from Rome, the Bolsheviks. There's so many that lead all the way to the Pacific and the same thing all the way to the Atlantic. And slowly Rome took over the world. Mm. And it starts there. And these terms are just terms about confederacies, quote, pagans, people that were probably going to need to be forced, conversed, or killed. And this kind of, through jumping around, connects with the world wars and the repopulation things that we were talking about and the underground. It's all kind of bridged together. But yeah, the Tartaria stuff, and again, this is my opinion, was just a loose branding of pagans or a confederacy of people that weren't all united. It wasn't just some happy-go-lucky place of unity. But when you trace the star forts and all of these things, you do find there had to be some cohesion. Perhaps that comes from a previous age and they were being repurposed. Who knows? But a lot of the star forts in America, and America is covered in star forts. They've all been dismantled or covered in mud. There are as many here as there were in Europe, and the old maps show this. It seems likely that that was from a previous age. And we've just repurposed them or taken them apart or whatever. But yeah, it starts with Rome. You can just look at the name. The Romani, you know, the Etruscans, the Etruscans have what they would describe as the earliest foundation in Rome, and then they were destroyed. The Etruscans are Phoenician. They were part of this merchant class. You can trace the Etruscans to Mexico, all over the East Coast. The Basque have a lot of relation in this too. But yeah, so a group of people took over Rome, and I would say this kind of ties into the egregore thought form, Ben Ben, magnetism, these living deities. It's like 2001, a space odyssey, the monolith. A new king was crowned, and it was a stone. And yeah, that's weird and out there. But when you study religions and stone worship and thought forms and egregores and all of these things, again, you need a million, you got to cover a lot of ground to start to piece it all together. And your show has done a great job of that for me. And hopefully I can fill in some holes for people out there listening. Yeah, man. I'm so impressed with the way you're able to take a lot of different information and, and try to incorporate it into a reconstruction because you're really not getting all of this information from any one source. You got to pull on a bunch of different threads. I'm just curious, do you have any favorite books that contain aspects of this history that even I should follow up on? Hmm. Not really. <laughs> I kind of, and you know, not to blow smoke, but really I, I listen to your podcast for since almost its inception. And that's about one of my only sources from a podcast's point of view. I don't watch too many YouTube videos. There are some that I do and I've tried to get on with them and connect minds with them. And as far as like the stuff we've talked about, there's really not a lot. That's why I've fallen in love with newspaper articles. Yeah. Because it really is so different. 
And there are some people out there that have written books about this, but they don't really touch on all of these subjects like I do. That's kind of why I've created my archive, and I still have 90% of my archive isn't even published yet, so I got a lot of work ahead of me. Mm -hmm. um, but the lodestone and all that stuff, there's nobody really. It was written a lot about in the 1600s, 1700s, but it was very esoteric. You know, the alchemy ties in with all of this stuff too, and it was very, you know, for the profane only, the priest class only. As you can see, that's no more obvious than Rome and the symbolism there. It's ancient. It's ancient symbolism. Symbolism so important. And you can start there with the symbolism. That'll lead you to language because from language is from, you know, pictographs and so on and so forth. And you just kind of put that time in and slowly you'll get to kind of a central source. And mm. it all has led me back to magnetism and this realm and consciousness is magnetism it's all one source you know the monad is the brain and the two hemispheres the two duality the dualistic nature of the magnet mm. yeah <laughs> yes man wow well the student has become the teacher <laughs> and i really appreciate you uh listening to the show for so long and now being a part of it we covered some really fun and wild stuff. Clearly, if even a fraction of this is true, then there's so much left to discover. And it's provocative to go down the road of how deep the manipulation could be. So I appreciate what you do and the time you took to talk to me today. Give the people any links or follow-up info you want them to have. So I have some plans for the future as far as like kind of creating a platform where I can discuss these things openly through my own lens. You know, I've really just Ever since the radio show got taken down, that was a few years ago, I've really only just gotten back into connecting with people and kind of sharing more of my opinions and my outlook on the reality we live in in this realm. And I'm going to be putting together some YouTube stuff. You know, I wouldn't call it a podcast, but interviews with people I'm interested in and trying to get some video stuff out there. But for now, you can find me on. Um, Twitter, I have one underscore analog underscore nine, and it's the same on Instagram. I've only been on Instagram for a few months and I'm just now transitioning some of my favorite stuff there. And the same is my YouTube channel. I have no videos up yet, but within a month or so, I plan on starting a few YouTube shorts and kind of reading through these articles as we have just to bring them to more eyes. But yeah, that's about all I got, you know, with with a family and three little kids, it's hard to find time to, but I, you know, my goal and dream is to provide a living for them in a similar way that you do, you know, reading and writing and all of these things. So, oh yeah, it's kind of fortuitous and amazing that I'm on your show right now and feel very blessed. Uh, well, thanks, man. I really appreciate all the work you do and, uh, I look forward to more in the future. Thanks again. Keep digging and best of luck out there. Thanks so much for having me on, Greg. Heck yeah, ladies and gentlemen of the internet. Another new guest who's doing some really unique stuff that was already familiar with THC when I reached out. That always makes me feel good and makes me think things are going to go well. And they did. I just really like what Analog does. It's a great strategy if you're going to make a name for yourself with this sort of research to be the old newspaper oddities guy. And it makes for some solid interview material. Sometimes these articles are a bit hard to read because the font is small and the scan isn't 100% and the language is often a bit different to the modern ear. But we got it done, and listening back to it, I think everything we covered came out pretty clear and easy to understand. The implications may not be easy to wrap one's head around at times, but that's the point, I guess. If you follow Analog on Twitter, though, he does a good job of curating the best of the best from these newspaper archives and highlighting the strangest lines from within each article. And it actually looks like he did a bit of a rebrand between the time of recording this and releasing it. Maybe he was just motivated to do more audio content. His handle and account are the same, but it looks like he's doing a series now called The Archivist. And he's three or four episodes in, which is great. I'm certainly going to add it to my long list of things to keep up on. 
And maybe we will get with his pal who runs the Old World Florida channel. Seems a bit synchronistic with the timing, and it might make me more jazzed up about moving to Florida and getting out and exploring it. And I guess for those that are curious, just a quick personal update. I did fly down there to be present for the inspection on this house that accepted our offer. And there were enough red flags that the deal got killed. The house had a sinkhole in the past and the property was in a pretty red flood zone. And I could tell there was just some curious language in the listing that made me a bit skeptical. And once we dug a bit deeper, it started to feel like we should just walk away. The final nail in the coffin was getting insurance quotes. And it was going to be $1,000 a month to insure that house. And that is a big no. But I used the rest of the weekend to really explore the area and the neighborhoods. And I found another house that we like in a lot better area. And if all goes well, now that we're under contract again, March will be my last month in San Diego. But I do hear this about Florida, that insurance is the big killer. Yes, yes, hurricanes, we know. But it's not just that, because every politician has their little deals that they make, and apparently DeSantis basically lets insurance companies do whatever, and everyone's rates are going way, way up. So I tried to be pretty careful. We got a place that's pretty far inland, out of any flood zone, which is harder to do than you might think. Yes, Florida is a wet place. But it's part of the insurance scam that you just make 80% of it a potential flood zone and then rake in the extra money. A couple of the floodplain designations actually say in the details they have a 1% chance of flooding every year. 1% isn't very much, but if you can classify the homes of tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people under this designation, well, they're all going to be paying you a lot more for something that has a 1% chance of happening. Good deal for them, but it is what it is. Anyway, the stuff we talked about in this one is just so interesting. I'm glad he added a layer to the whole weird loop where Trump is written on the Charles Delshaw airship drawings. I think it's even numbered image 45 too. But then to add in this stuff about radium and the Ingersoll watch company buying it up, that's just wild. Ingersoll Lockwood being the author who wrote the Baron Trump books, one even called the last president. It's so weird. And it's all right in the late 1800s, early 1900s window. Then you have Trump's uncle as the guy getting access to all Tesla's stuff. This all butts right up against the secret sciences and the whole frequency, energy, electromagnetism wheelhouse. I know we've talked about it before. I just love it. But the radium component does seem like a big missing piece that analog has added to the puzzle. But the real scoop, the real star of this show is these underground ruins or cities. I don't even know the right term. But the scope of them is much bigger than previously thought. Huge statues and bas reliefs? I never really heard anything like that outside of the Grand Canyon stories. Up until learning about Analog's work, the stories I heard was that the early settlers would just find bones of giants, maybe some armor and a giant axe or some Bronze Age tools or weapons. But this is several orders of magnitude more developed. And then there are the weird things like this that we didn't even mention, but Pygmy Graveyard in Tennessee, Woodbury, Tennessee Press, 1876. An ancient graveyard of vast proportions has been found in Coffee County. It is similar to those found in White County and other places in Tennessee, but it is vastly more extensive and shows that the race of pygmies who once inhabited this country were very numerous. A dwarf race of people about three foot high where an estimated 75 to 100,000 bodies were buried into a six-acre graveyard. I mean, where's that in any history book? Man, the lodestone stuff and the baby farm stuff, this was just a wild one, and I hope he'll come back and talk to me again. The Plus Show is also just full of great stuff. The plasma attacks and resets idea and archaics we talked about. 
We got into Analog's favorite story, maybe mine too. We talked about Edgar Casey, giant monsters, and the Atlanteans, golf courses, old world Florida, and hiding the past. Become a Plus member and start it with a seven-day free trial, thehiresidechats.com. Stop missing half the show. Also, I know we picked a super long story for the Plus show, but it is interesting and unique and has all sorts of cool little details. I guess we could have tried to cut it down, but it's hard when you don't have actual text. You have screenshots of newspaper articles, and it's easier to just forge ahead and keep reading. But also in the Plus show, Analog mentioned Maurice Cotterell, someone I wasn't familiar with at all, but listen to this little bio here. In 1989, engineer and scientist Maurice Cotterell found a way of calculating the duration of long-term magnetic reversals on the sun. Using this knowledge, he was able to break the codes of ancient sun-worshipping civilizations, first the Maya in Central America and those of Tutankhamun in Egypt, before cracking the codes of the terracotta warriors of China and the European Celts. His research explains how our 28-day spinning sun regulates fertility in females and how it determines personality of the fetus in the womb with sun sign astrology. It explains how the sun causes schizophrenia, how mobile phones and overhead power lines cause cancer, and how VDUs, which are TV and computer screens cause miscarriages. And his work explains how the sun brings periodic catastrophic destruction to Earth every few thousand years. His own unique decoding process reveals amazing pictures from archaeological treasures that explain the spiritual mysteries of life, why we are born, why we die, and why this has to be. His work, best described as Adventure Fact, brings together modern science, spirituality, and ancient wisdom to unlock the secrets of the past and the science of the future. Very cool. This is really Electric Universe adjacent, and I'm into it. I'm going to have to learn more about this Maurice fella, but this whole episode was really right up my alley, and I hope you guys agree. In higher side news, the outline auction is still going on, but it's certainly slowing down a bit. Maybe because the less popular shows that were in our first batch got auto-relisted and people just still don't care? Maybe it's a dumb thing to be doing, period, but these little $40 sales stack up and the ones that people really want have gone for a lot more than that, and I can already say that it's certainly been worth my time and effort. But I'm only like 10% through what I got. Am I really going to continue on? I don't know. I just added a new batch last night with some great shows in there. Joseph Farrell, Derek Bros, Matthew LaCroix, Chad Stemke with the esoteric Stargate Detroit stuff, Zachary Hubbard and his numerology show, Michael Wan, Sylvia Ivanoa. A lot of classics in this latest round. And I guess just to mention a couple logistical things I didn't think about, one issue has been international shipping. Well, let me just say, yes, I will ship internationally. I think it's about $10 on average, but I will do it. I thought I had it coded in there, but eBay, apparently the listings say that I won't do it. So just place a bid, and if you win, we will work it out. Another factor has been combined shipping. I didn't really think much about people buying multiple outlines, but That is also something I will do. You don't have to pay individual shipping for each one. After the auctions are over, eBay actually has a nice feature of grouping items together and just charging shipping once. So if you get several of them, just know you'll get a combined invoice a day or two after the auction ends. But I don't know. This was a random stab in the dark at throwing out some THC memorabilia, and I guess it's just hard to describe what it is or how much detail I really do put into these outlines. It's typically much more material than the show actually has time for, so maybe some are like a sort of podcaster's DVD extras. But I do see some people who picked up a couple and actually received them already trying to get more in rounds two and three. And I appreciate that. It shows that people aren't disappointed by what they get. Anyway, enough about that. Let's jump over to the meetup calendar. In just a few days, February 26th, there is a meetup in Asheville, North Carolina. 
Then March 4th, stay golden in Sedona, in Sedona, Arizona. The host says, just a guy looking to meet cool, like minds, high on life and consciousness. Well, who could say no to that? March 10th, the Rochester THC meetup, actually in Scottsville, New York, at Dirty Dave's Bar and Grill. March 11th, the Doc Coffee Spooner, Wisconsin game day at the Doc Coffee in Spooner. Wisconsin. Also March 11th, Vancouver Island Beach Meetup in British Columbia. March 18th, the Harrisburg, Oregon Meetup at the Olson Run Winery. And then one in Arroyo Seco, New Mexico. Probably butchered it, but if you're around there, you know what I'm trying to say. (laughs) And March 23rd, another one in New Mexico at Cerro de la Olla. I took a stab at it and let that be the thing. So a lot of good ones. March is filling up. I love it. Not a bad way to meet some cool new people through a mutual love of the weird stuff we get into around here. And that's pretty much the show. Big thanks to Analog. You gotta let them know. Find them on Twitter at one underscore analog underscore nine or just click the link in the show notes. You're already on your phone. But thanks to you guys for listening. Thanks for all the positive feedback and reviews. Thanks for sharing these shows with your friends. It all means a lot. I am the luckiest guy ever. Take care of you and yours out there. I've done my part. Your move, newspaper story suppressors, radium secret keepers, and bizarre baby farmers. Your fucking move. Lucid dreams are so vivid Cause you go to bed at seven And your brain comes alive Cause you hate your nine to five You wake up with a dread And make sure your cats are fed Did your brain talk to a ghost Who moved your coffee and your toast As you listen to the higher side chats You get to your desk And your boss says it's a mess And your soul slowly grows To a place where nothing grows When you think he's not around You insert a steady sound The OM says turn it down And you say it's just the higher side chats Oh, do you think you'll be invited To Bohemia Grove To a Bilderberg Club Oh, do you think you'll be invited Buy a Rothschild to a party on a submarine Diving down To the center of the earth To the Marianas Trench Your teeth begin to clench From the sulfurous stench The mask you're given doesn't fit Cause you're not one of them Starting today, you'll make plans to get away There's no one to hold you down And the what-ifs start to drown Then you wake to the glare of a cold fluorescent stare And the light winks at you Cause its life is almost through But it's holding on to quit time just like you It's time for the high side chats (laughs) 